morning, everyone, and welcome back to the second day of a fully digital Economic Ideas Forum. I remind you that you can join the debate by using the hashtag EIF20 on social media. We will start our day by discussing the road towards a European digital single market. To help us do that, I invite you to answer the following poll on Slido.com using the code EIF20. In five years from now, will the EU be able to catch up with the United States and China in the, in the digital race? We will have a look at the results halfway into the panel debate. Without further delay, I'd like to give the floor to Anna Van Uveren, Communications and Press Officer at Martin Center, who will moderate today's first discussion. Can digital make Europe great again? Anna, over to you. Thank you, Anna. Yes, we're both called Anna, so that's now out of the way. Very good morning to everyone joining us online, and of course to my five speakers I'll be presenting shortly. In her political guidelines, Commission President von der Leyen stressed the need for Europe to lead the transition to a healthy planet and a new digital world. Digital solutions such as communication systems, artificial intelligence, or quantum technologies can enrich our lives in many ways. But the benefits arising from digital technologies do not come without risks and costs. Citizens no longer feel in control over what happens with their personal data and are increasingly overloaded by artificial solicitations of their attention. And malicious cyber activity may threaten our personal well-being or disrupt our critical infrastructures and wider security interests. For this important subject, I'm very lucky to have five esteemed panelists joining me online. First off, Mr. Micha Boni, former MEP and a senior research associate of the Martin Center. Welcome. Then we, thank you. Then we have Mr. Pablo Arias Echeverria, MEP sitting in the Committee on the Internal Market and Consumer Protection, IMCO. And by the way, just a sidebar, Mr. Echeverria will not be able to fully stay with us for the entire session, so I will ask him more questions in the first half of our panel. We also thank have hearing from Greece, Mr. Konstantinos Kiranakis, Member of the Greek Parliament. Good morning. And then we have as well Michael Pantelides from DG Connect at the European Commission. And finally, a big welcome as well to Mr. David Wilden, Group Director of Public Policy and Public Affairs at Sky. And my first question goes directly to you, Mr. Wilden. Digital matters, you know, can sometimes seem nebulous for us non-tech savvy citizens. With the European Commission's ambitions that I just outlined, and the current pieces of regulations that we've heard uh, some, some rumors about, what from a perspective from the business sector would you say is your assessment of these developments and these ambitions? What could be concretely, possibly, the impact on EU citizens' lives and on business in Europe? Thank you. Well, good morning, Anna, and um, it, it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, or rather here virtually, talking at the Martin Center again. I, I was last uh, talking uh, at your EIF event two years ago. And uh, what I wouldn't give to be uh, with you in Brussels today, um, but we are where we are. And obviously COVID is creating a, a, a pretty um, interesting and uh, challenging backdrop to this whole debate. I, I think what I want to say at a, at a very high level, working for a business that is really comes up against um, a lot of these technology issues time and time again, as, as Europe's one of Europe's largest media companies, one of the biggest providers of news and current affairs programming, and also a, 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 a significant uh, telecoms business. We see this in, in, a, in a number of different ways, but, but primarily we see the two key issues that we believe that that Europe needs to address right now. And they are two sides of the same coin, if you like. On the one hand, we have the societal challenges that digital technology is creating, the uh, challenges to our uh, very foundations of democracy and the way in which we uh, relate to each other in the modern world. And we all know how uh, social media and technology has created uh, some real challenges in the way in which our society uh, governs our safety and thinks about the role of the citizen. And then on the other hand, we have the challenge that's created economically uh, to, uh, to our business sectors. The challenges and opportunities, of course, because technology has fundamentally 
changed our economic paradigm, uh, allowed businesses to get to consumers in a more efficient way. But it's also created massive disruption. And indeed, it's created massive disruption to some very important uh, service providers and established businesses um, here in Europe. And I think the way the two sides of this coin come together is that, in effect, we have been operating for far too long, for over 20 years now, on a playing field that is not level for any of us, whether as private citizens or as uh, uh, corporate businesses. What, what we've been facing is essentially a, an emergent business sector, technology sector, that has operated in an entirely unregulated way. Now, it has sought to step into some of that by self-regulating, but operating as a regulated business ourselves, we can see some of the flaws, some of the many flaws in that, which is that we don't, as um, the body politic, have any real oversight, any real understanding, indeed, of the, uh, uh, of the measures that these new businesses, these disruptors, are taking, either to keep us safe or, indeed, to behave responsibly when it comes to their impact on our uh, economies. And therefore, I think ultimately the, uh, the, the level playing field is the kind of key underpinning of what the European Union, what the Commission is writing in its legislative proposals right now. And, uh, and uh, that level playing field is essentially going to have to address some of these key questions about responsibility uh, and about the impact of disruption uh, on our lives, both personally and economically. I think what I would finally say is that in order to have a level playing field, given so much of our sectors operate in a responsibly regulated manner, we are going to have to move away from the days of self-regulation. That there is, and I don't think there is too much debate about that. It appears to be a, a widely accepted view what the, the the devil will of course be in the detail because ultimately uh, the type of regulatory uh, environment that the that the new legislative package creates needs to reflect both the idiosyncrasies and the differences between the sectors but also the need for that fundamental level playing field and if if a regulatory environment is created that is ultimately too unbalanced that still maintains heavy regulation on sectors such as European media, but allows a much more lenient and self-regulatory environment for the technology sector. We won't have addressed those issues of safety. We won't have addressed those issues of societal disruption, and we won't have addressed some of those economic issues. Uh, and that's the real challenge. Uh, and I, I look forward to hearing the perspective of the other panelists. Uh, on this, and maybe we can debate some of the details um, further down. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Wilden. We'll definitely debate more on these issues as well, especially like you you uh, stressed, the level playing field is obviously extremely important to get this going, get, create this environment that has this possibility for several European companies and competitors, obviously, to, to emerge. Um, this is why I want to turn to our MEP, sitting MEP, Mr. Echeverria. I was wondering, obviously, we don't know much with the upcoming pieces of regulation that the European Commission will be proposing on these issues. But from the echoes that you've already perceived and from what we discussed just now, uh, what would you say from this perspective of the European Parliament should be the focus even more of this future regulation? How would you feel the, uh, the what are the members of Parliament discussing on how to secure this level playing field and to make sure basically as well, this is a big concern obviously of the EPP, that there are no digital des deserts in Europe, that no one's left behind. Would you answer this please? Uh, thank you, Anna, and uh, thank you for inviting me today. And to, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, well, uh, just to 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 react to, to the first uh, question that you have uh, done uh, to, to the to the my uh, 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 the, the person that has uh, talked uh, before me, uh, I just want to 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 share with you about uh, what we have uh, today on the digital uh, uh, area around the globe. We have uh, two possible ways of success of doing things in the internet. Uh, the US one, based on a business-oriented uh, approach, the Chinese 
uh, one based on a, a government centric uh, centric uh, approach uh, but uh, we are trying to build uh, uh, the third way of doing things that uh, should be the european way of doing things uh, we, we we must find our own way to uh, regulate the digital single market uh, uh, a third way that uh, is based uh, on our values, on uh, especially in the protection of our data and uh, privacy, that uh, it is uh, uh, absolutely uh, 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 important for, for Europeans. Uh, in the long run, this will, uh, in my opinion, uh, result uh, in a competitive advantage, and we can uh, not uh, do the same mistakes that we have uh, done in the past. In this, we, uh, uh, we have to, to, to make sure that the investments uh, of the European companies uh, 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 result in a, a European revenue that, in my opinion, uh, is not the, the, what, ha what had happened in the, in the past. The Commission, uh, in my opinion, is uh, well aware of this uh, and uh, the need to cut uh, uh, distances with China and, uh, and uh, the US in the, this uh, digital race. Therefore, it has been uh, uh, presented uh, a comprehensive uh, digital strategy. Uh, the, 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 but we uh, heard only the refrain. Uh, we want to hear the whole the score. And uh, as uh, uh, it has said here, the, the devil is in, in the details. We want to hear the whole score. Uh, we want to, to, to know the lyrics and to work on it uh, that convince uh, uh, all the stockholders uh, uh, involved. We await specific actions uh, that encourage our companies to invest in the, ter uh, in the EU territory and, and, and make sure that uh, they profit from uh, them, avoiding foreign, uh, uh, let me say it like this, parasites that are now uh, the GNs. Uh, this said, uh, a simplification of the digital regulation is also needed. It makes no sense that our companies uh, uh, keep investing in Europe infrastructures uh, if they are uh, continu continuously blocked by our uh, uh, bureaucracy. Uh, uh, everyone must be, a, 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 must be uh, agile uh, to survive uh, in this uh, digital ecosystem, not only the, the, the private uh, companies, not only the, 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 the GNs, also the SMEs, uh, but also in the, in the, in the public uh, uh, sector. We, we must be uh, more agile and to try to adapt what we have uh, to, the, to the reality of the uh, digitalization. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pablo. Actually, I just want to stay with you for a bit because, uh, as I said, I want to maximize your presence here. Um, you are the rapporteur on digital services in the IMCO committee. I was wondering if, in particular, you would maybe walk us through the legislative work that you're doing right now. What is like the top priority of your committee at this moment? What are some of the files that you're working on, just for our viewers to know a bit more about what the European Parliament does more concretely to help European citizens at this moment? Well, I, 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 I think I really think that uh, uh, what we have to 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 take uh, into account is that um, what we have on the table is uh, this uh, third way to do things. I mean, uh, uh, citizens here uh, are not uh, are not uh, uh, are, they they worry a lot about uh, about the privacy and all that. But uh, we are going. Uh, in the sense the, of the question that you are uh, telling me that uh, we are going to, through a very uh, sensitive uh, moment for Europe in the global digital race. Uh, uh, our goal must uh, be to improve uh, European competitiveness uh, in this global digital economy and achieve uh, uh, technological uh, sovereignty. Uh, at present, uh, we are uh, very far uh, from, from, from that. Uh, the, the EU has uh, little to say in this uh, global, uh, in, in, for the first time in a global revolution, the digital revolution, uh, and uh, this is not good for, for Europe, so we have to, to, to uh, think about what we have uh, done uh, wrong. Uh, this is uh, mainly because, uh, in my opinion, two factors. Uh, a negative environment uh, to allow our companies to, 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 to innovate, 
and uh, competitive barriers in our territory uh, due to uh, strict uh, competition uh, rules that uh, must be uh, adapted uh, to the, the, the digital uh, uh, area or, or site. Having said this, we must uh, now focus on how to catch up with other uh, regions uh, in this uh, global uh, uh, race, in this uh, digital race. And I think the first step towards that uh, is uh, establishing an effective framework uh, for the use of, uh, of data, always respecting our uh, values uh, of the European way of life. Uh, this will allow us uh, to, to develop uh, key technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence, cloud infrastructures, quantum computers, and, and, and so on and so on. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Pablo. Um, from what I hear, I hear a lot of, you know, talking the talk, but now we definitely need to walk the walk, basically. So that's the quite enlightening. Thank you very much for this. I will come back to you at some point as well. Now I'd like to talk more from a national member state perspective. So I'm addressing this next question to you, Mr. Kiranakis. I was wondering if you could walk us through what it's like right now in Greece. I mean, obviously, COVID has had repercussions on many countries, mostly actually the Mediterranean countries on their tourism sectors. Obviously, I don't want to talk about tourism right now, but if you could maybe walk us through, has this accelerated a digital transition for Greek businesses, for instance? Are you worried maybe that some Greek businesses are not going to be able to do this transition as fast as they maybe should be? Could you give us your input on this? I have a mic problem. Are you sure your audio is tuned on? Um, I'm being told you're you're on mute. Oh, yeah. how about now? Perfect. Yeah. All I'm right. Clear. Okay. So th thank you, Anna, for the invitation, and I'm very happy to uh, be here on this panel. Um, at, at this great event, the Economic Ideas Forum, which has already a great history. So uh, to address your question, yes, a lot of interesting things are happening uh, in Greece uh, since the COVID crisis. Of course, Greece have, have been lagging behind uh, other European countries uh, in terms of digitalization. Uh, and, and this is why the progress has been so fast during the, the last six months. Uh, more than 500 services of the public sector have been uh, digitalized. Um, a, a lot of uh, e-shops uh, here in Greece have been uh, skyrocketing during during the COVID crisis, and um, the the public, the general public, need seems to be embracing uh, this whole digital revolution that is happening here. But um, I'm 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 sad to see that Greece is still lagging behind um, in in the tech scene. Uh, that is progressing in the rest of Europe. And what I mean by that is that, um, for example, uh, right now we see that uh, it's much easier in Europe to, um, uh, to have access to capital. Uh, we see that in the last decade, the first four or five years, I think, uh, between 2010 and 2014, um, 34 billions were invested in EU tech companies uh, and in the last uh, five years, this figure has skyrocketed to 113 billion, with only um, 37 billion in 2019, so only in one year. Uh, we see that uh, five years ago, uh, we had 22 unicorns, so companies that have a valuation over, over 1 billion uh, euros. Uh, in, in 2019, uh, these companies were 99, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, this year, they have gone up to 165. Uh, unfortunately, only one company uh, from Greece um, is close to achieve uh, that milestone. Uh, this company is called Blue Ground, and it has to do with um, uh, it, it's uh, it has to do with apartments. Uh, so it's it's a company that resembles the Airbnb model. Um, but what we see uh, in Europe. And I say Europe and not the European Union because of most of what is happening in the tech scene is happening in the UK, uh, which is the country that by far uh, is able to attract tech talent. Uh, and this is, uh, this is reflecting in all the figures that we have uh, access to. Um, so what we see uh, is that it's now much easier, as I said before, uh, to have access to capital. It's much easier to, um, to have uh, 
access to talent, uh, Europe right now has more developers than the United States. And this is something that not many people know. Uh, there are a lot of uh, young European uh, kids who have interest in technology. And this is why I think um, that Europe needs to take a step ahead and educate European kids already in schools uh, about technologies of the future. Uh, one of the proposals that uh, I have made in the Greek Parliament, and uh, I think there was uh, there was a very positive feedback, is to introduce uh, artificial intelligence uh, already in um, in schools from a very young age, uh, so as to prepare the next generation of uh, of European professionals, not only European developers but in general European professionals, to be able to cope with the digital revolution that they will face. Uh, in 10 years from now. Uh, many more jobs that, that these kids will, um, uh, will, will try to get in, uh, in 12 or 15 years from now will have to do with AI, will have to do with um, technologies of the future, and we need to prepare them. And I think, apart from schools, uh, it's, 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 a very positive, uh, it's very positive that uh, five out of 10 universities right now globally um, in tech are European. Uh, this, these are the uh, ETH and the EPFL from Switzerland, Oxford and Cambridge from the UK, the Technical University um, uh, of Munich in Germany, the TU Delft from the Netherlands, the Ecole Polytechnique in France, uh, and some more as well. The uh, Polytechnic uh, University in, in Greece as well is doing better. Um, but Europe perhaps needs to uh, set a goal and have at least one of these universities uh, compete with a uh, university like Stanford. So if we want to prepare the next generation of Europeans uh, to be able to compete globally, um, technologically in, 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 all this, um, uh, in all these sectors, we need to start at the school level, uh, then invest in, uh, in a university that will be able to compete with uh, the top Chinese and the, the top American universities, and also invest um, in big European companies that will be able to acquire other companies globally. What we see in, in the last years is that uh, American companies are acquiring uh, big, uh, big European companies that uh, have the potential to be much bigger. And this is good on one hand from an investment point of view. Uh, I mean, every investor wants to have a successful exit, but it's not very good if we want to be the leader uh, in technology. And therefore, I think that the third uh, step that Europe needs to take uh, is to invest in companies that can connect themselves to industries that are already strong uh, in Europe, uh, such as the, the automotive industry, the financial services, uh, tourism perhaps, industries that Europe uh, has already uh, a lot of success stories can be connected to European tech companies and therefore lead the way uh, for not only unicorns, but uh, what in the Silicon Valley call uh, decacorns. So companies that uh, can uh, have a valuation of more than 10 billion or perhaps even more. Uh, so this is my first take and I'm of course open for any questions. Great, thank you. That was very enlightening as well and very interesting to hear how Greece has been faring since the start of this pandemic. Um, I'd like to turn my question now next to Mr. Pantelides. What in your opinion, because we've heard now several stories of, you know, there are more unicorns now in Europe, but still it's, it's quite lagging behind other competitors on the global stage. What do you think explains this lack of unicorns on the European digital landscape? Thanks for inviting me uh, once again. Uh, I'm replacing Martin Bailey, who unfortunately, as a sign of our times, has fallen sick with COVID-19. Uh, but I'm, I'm very, I'm listening in very carefully to to what you're saying, and I'm very interested, uh, in particular, in uh, what um, His Honor Mr. Giranagis just just mentioned. Uh, so I would indeed uh, not paint the the picture as bleak as perhaps. Uh, one might. Uh, if we look at the, the number of tech IPOs in 2018 in Europe, for example, including the UK, of course, with that caveat, was 2.5 times that of the US. Uh, and the gap with Silicon Valley in China is usually based on a comparison with uh, big tech companies like Google and Apple. However, when it comes to newer companies, uh, we see a smaller gap. 
So Europe's five most valuable VC-backed companies are Spotify, Agen, Supercell, Delivery Hero, Zalando, these uh, big uh, valuable companies. Uh, if we compare them against a comparable set uh, of VC-backed companies in the USA, like Uber, Zoom, Skype, uh, uh, and work the difference is only a factor of 2.2. Uh, uh, these are statistics that I, I take from online from Atomico and uh, the state of European tech. So uh, Europe, we see, has seen the largest proportion of seed investments in 2019 compared to uh, North America and Asia. So that was 38%. Uh, so we see the biggest problem is not in seed or early stage financing, but in late stage financing. Uh, particularly, there's a lack of funding in certain regions, um, as Mr. Giranakis mentioned, and there's also the Central and Eastern European region. Uh, and this is somehow analogous also to the US, where there is uh, also regional concentration of funds. As, as far as what we can do, um, well, we see particularly with coronavirus that uh, it's really hit all sectors quite hard, um, including traditional SMEs and high-tech startups. Uh, in response to the crisis, we need to support young ventures and scale-ups, not only with loans and guarantees, but also with equity, including through European public and private funds. Uh, commission is taking certain concrete actions in this respect. So, <clears throat> number one, uh, a billion euro will be made available from the budget to the as a guarantee to the EIF to mobilize eight billion of working capital for over a hundred thousand uh, European SMEs. Uh, there is the thirty-seven billion euro Corona Response Investment Initiative through the structural funds that will include support both for SMEs. Uh, working capital and short-term employment schemes. The European Commission has recently proposed the uh, Coronavirus Investment Initiative Plus, which will introduce flexibility by allowing utilised uh, support from the structural investment funds to be mobilised. Uh, we're, we're currently really looking at numerous ideas. Uh, a concrete step uh, that I should also mention uh, is to boost the equity for scale-ups and promising companies. And in this respect, we published a call to select financial intermediaries under Escalar, which is a first of a kind risk reward mechanism to boost the availability of venture capital funds. Uh, so I, I think I'll stop there and uh, I'll pass it before back to you, Anna. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. And uh, we wish, of course, Mr. Bailey a speedy recovery as well. Thank you so much for, for replacing him on such short notice. It was really helpful for this panel because we, we definitely don't want to miss the, uh, the Commission's opinion on these matters, obviously. Um, I'd like to as well, by the way, I encourage my speakers as well to bounce off each other. Huh? If, you, if you hear something that's striking to you, please feel free to, you know, raise a hand. I'll give you the floor and uh, you can, you know, share your remarks with us. I'd like to uh, go now to Mr. Bonny. Um, Mr. Bonny, you, uh, you were an MEP, an eminent MEP in the ITRE and Libe, Libe committees at the European Parliament. Um, from what you've gathered right now, because now you're a researcher, so you've been doing a lot of analysis on these matters, also for the Martin Center quite a bit. Um, you've seen now different versions, like we all have, of the multi-financial uh, framework. And some of them don't really have great prospects for the digital era that Ms. von der Leyen has announced in several of her speeches. Do you think that the Commission has the means to reach the ambitions it has set itself? And how could it claim basically to, to regulate the digital lives in Europe, creating a level playing field for all economic actors when there's barely any financial stronghold to, be to back up these statements? Thank you. Yeah, it's a very important question. Uh, but I want to say that uh, 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 all depends on member states, because member states decided uh, at the end of July uh, uh, to make uh, cuts uh, in digital programs in uh, healthcare area and also in Horizon Europe. Uh, now European Parliament is expecting and discussing uh, about uh, additional money 
uh, for the MFF and recovery plan. It's just about 39 billion of euro. And uh, as I know, uh, uh, it will be possible to take the part. But uh, of course, I agree with you that this is some kind of, of contradiction between an announcement done by uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, that it will be digital decade in the European Union in Europe and uh, the, uh, the sources of money. So my view is that we need to talk much more strongly with member states and to convince them that uh, digital now, it's not only the separated area, that it's crucial, fundamental for all economic possibilities and uh, development. It means that we need to probably combine uh, uh, sources done by uh, in my, uh, multi-annual financial framework for digital, for healthcare, for new technologies, and combine those sources with all which will be uh, uh, in uh, uh, cohesion policies uh, uh, led by member states. This is the only way to improve the situation and to make much, uh, to create the much bigger money for the solution. The second is what was uh, e expressed uh, very strongly by our Greek colleague. It's a relationship between the research and science, scientific area and business. I think that when we are Talking about future competitive uh, advantages in the European Union at the digital area, we need there is a lack of uh, 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 some uh, commercialization. Uh, we have many um, uh, invented inventions. We have many new achievements done by uh, research area, but it's not so easy to translate it to the uh, uh, concrete uh, practical. Uh, industrial business solutions. So this is the second way. And uh, uh, also I think that uh, we need to understand that not only money will um, uh, uh, influence on the possibilities to create uh, much more competitive digitally, much more competitive European Union. This is also uh, management uh, of law. And this is also uh, the question done uh, uh, and um, uh, raised by, by my colleagues, uh, it means uh, digital literacy, it means education. So if we will look in comprehensive way, it will be much more clear to understand and persuade, convince member states that uh, the only way for the European Union and the only way for countries to create uh, 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 digital uh, uh, new competitive uh, advantages for all of us uh, is related to the digital issues. Uh, coronavirus shows how important digital is uh, in the area of education, in the area of uh, healthcare, uh, in the area of uh, teleworking, uh, in uh, making uh, better access to uh, uh, culture uh, in a democratic way and also with full respect to the copyright. So I think that we need to go this way, comprehensive, holistic view, and uh, I, I have no problem with the Commission. Commission uh, uh, done what was possible, uh, but the member states should change their view on the digital challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Bonny. I'd like to turn again to our MEP, who sadly has to leave us again uh, in a few minutes. So I was just wondering, when you, when you hear these discussions that we've just had about the Commission's ambitions, the means it has set itself, of course, the national member states that, you know, pass the ball along about the MFF negotiations, where does the European Parliament stand on this with the current MFF? Are you satisfied with what you're seeing? Uh, Anna, can you hear me well? Because sometimes I don't hear you uh, well, so I'm, I'm not sure about uh, the question that you are... Uh, uh... Okay, let me repeat then in that case. Yeah, I was asking you. you basically, following the discussions that we just had, what Mr. Boni was saying about national member states also having the responsibility on the multi-financial framework. And of course, the means that the uh, Commission has at its disposal to advance the digital services for European citizens. What is the European Parliament's stance on this? And in particular, in your committee, are you worried when you look at the current MFF proposal? Well, for sure, um, uh, we, 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 we worry. I mean, uh, the Commission, I think uh, they are doing uh, uh, a good job 
uh, but maybe uh, and sometimes it's not enough. I think that the the, the parliament has to take into account uh, uh, the importance of what we have uh, here. Uh, I think that the, uh, the bet for uh, uh, the digital uh, uh, pillar is uh, uh, indispensable for our economies. So uh, the Commission, in my opinion, is absolutely aware of this and uh, for sure the Parliament is. The problem uh, is uh, how to, 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 to avoid, uh, how to, to, to launch uh, measures capable to 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 uh, uh, relaunch the digital uh, area around Europe and, and not as a national level but uh, as a pan-european level uh, as as you know the this is the the most uh, fragmented uh, 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 in 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 legislative uh, terms uh, a parliament that we have uh, uh, the, the 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 app is still has been the the, the biggest group in Parliament, but uh, uh, we uh, have to negotiate everything uh, just to make sure that uh, we got uh, something uh, um, clear and, and something that should be helpful just to try to, to um, uh, be uh, something and to, to and to do a good job in the in the digital race. Uh, having said this, what uh, we are uh, doing, I mean, uh, we have done uh, three um, uh, any reports uh, that uh, we have uh, already um, uh, uh, approved uh, last week uh, here in Parliament. Uh, we, I think, it's a good reaction uh, uh, to uh, what the Commission uh, has uh, proposed. I think that the Commission is uh, doing, uh, as I said, a good job because uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Commissioner Breton and also Vice President Vestager, they know well uh, what's going on and, 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 and they are trying to find uh, uh, possibilities and solutions just to adapt the uh, European uh, uh, economy to, 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 to uh, the digital, uh, the digital uh, 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 era that uh, we are uh, facing, I think that we lost the train of the digital uh, of the uh, of this uh, race uh, uh, in the last uh, ten years. We we can all uh, uh, remember uh, brands like Nokia and others that uh, now, uh, if we ask the young people, they don't know anything about it. We were talking about unicorns, and uh, we have just a few in Europe. And in my opinion, is something that uh, we have to 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 uh, uh, think why we uh, or companies have uh, a lot of difficulties uh, to, to become uh, a unicorns. Uh, and, uh, and in my opinion, is because we have done something uh, wrong and we have to take into account that uh, we have to adapt uh, all our, uh, our efforts, not only in terms of uh, financial efforts, but also in legislative uh, 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 efforts, just to simplify and to try to uh, uh, build uh, a good uh, ecosystem uh, that should uh, be helpful for our companies. We are not uh, against the giants of internet. Uh, uh, it should be a mistake, but uh, we uh, have to be in favor of uh, promoting uh, measures for our companies, for our SMEs, for entrepreneurs, for our entrepreneurs. So uh, that's uh, what we are trying to do from uh, the parliament. That is something that is what I think that we should uh, 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 do. And is, uh, in my opinion, the, the place where we could be uh, helpful. Uh, in this uh, in this race, so that is exactly what uh, we are trying to do uh, from the parliament. As I said, the commission, I think they are doing a good job, but uh, we have to to try to 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 uh, uh, get something uh, that should be helpful for mm -hmm. for for companies and and also for the economy of the European. If we uh, take this uh, from the perspective as a national level, I think what we should. Uh, uh, keep doing uh, a mistake, an incredible mistake. Uh, when we talk about uh, digital, uh, we have to, uh, uh, we need to have a biggest, a bigger uh, uh, perspective of what's going on because digitalize, uh, digitalization is uh, uh, is uh, have done as a global level, and uh, and we uh, have to start thinking 
at least as a pan-European level and not at uh, as a national level in the digital uh, uh, area. Uh, and, and, and we have to do uh, and to put our efforts on that, in my opinion. Okay. Well, that sounds wonderful. And actually, I'm thinking, looking at the time, that this might be the moment that you want to sign off. I see Mr. Boni as well waving in. Um, I'm going to let Mr. Boni briefly answer to you. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, you're gone. <laughs> well, thanks a lot Thank for you. being with us. But Mr. Boni, please take the floor. Just in addition, I agree with Mr. Echeverria that uh, digital challenges should be raised at the European level. But uh, when I have mentioned mentioned uh, the uh, member states, it means that I want to involve them much more strongly to the work on future digital uh, uh, of Europe, because uh, this is the only way to combine money from the European sources, uh, as it is, and I would like to have uh, much more money for those investments. But on the other hand, to uh, persuade, to convince member states that they also uh, should invest in digital issues and for digital challenges for the future. It doesn't mean that uh, we need to solve all digital problems only at the level of uh, only at the national level. Cooperation and combination of two efforts are needed. Okay, well that's pretty clear. Actually, I want to go to my colleague Anna because uh, we have the Slido poll, the results are out, so Anna. Floor is yours. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we have a bit of a pessimistic tilt in our audience mm -hmm. as to the question, in five years from now, will the EU be able to catch up with the United States and China in the digital race? The results of the voting was 60% no and 40% yes. Not a huge split, but still. But Anna, you still have some time with the speakers, so maybe by the end of the panel, you will be able to change your mind's audience. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, I kind of hope we do, <laughs> but let's see. Um, our panelists, when you see a poll like this, this it sounds pretty pessimistic, obviously. Do you, do you feel the same way about this? Who wants to take the floor on, on this question? No volunteers? I'm just going to, yeah, please go, Mr. Kiranakis and then Mr. Boni. Thank you, Anna. I think the numbers are not so bad. I think if we, you would take the same poll um, three or four years ago, the numbers would be much worse. Uh, perhaps not even 10% of uh, Europeans would believe that uh, we would be able to catch up with uh, the digital race with the US and China. Um, but as I said before, and I, I heard uh, my colleague, Mr. Echeverria, um, of course, we're in different parliaments, but still, um, to, to, to refer to European unicorns as something that we're lacking behind. I will repeat the figures that I said in my first, um, uh, in my first take. Uh, until 2015, uh, there were only 39 unicorns. Now there are more than 165. This is a big progress, and it shows that the European member states and the European Union and the European space, the European tech space as a whole, uh, has uh, not only started to understand the value of uh, technology for the European economy, but we have created the tools um, um, to, to help European companies to thrive. Uh, the fact that European companies like Booking.com or Spotify have uh, reached a global audience so fast and they're being so successful is not a matter, it's not a matter of luck. It's a matter of uh, investment in infrastructure, in funding, um, and in regulating, of course, there are steps that can be uh, be taken ahead, uh, but it's it's not so bad as it looks. So 40% of optimism is, is better than uh, what we used to have some years ago. Okay. Well, I like the optimistic twist as well. Mr. Bonnie, you wanted to add something as well? And then I'll take Mr. Will. Yeah, just uh, f firstly, one example. Uh, one year ago, we uh, uh, afraid that... Uh, it will be no possible to go and build uh, 5G infrastructure, um, thinking about dangers uh, done by Huawei in uh, building this infrastructure. But it turned out that Ericsson and Nokia are ready to uh, uh, offer to the uh, uh, telecom uh, operators in Europe uh, uh, some tools and uh, devices which can, um, which can make... Uh, 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 building the infra 5G infrastructure much more real. So this is the first thing. We have many companies advanced, but this is a question we need to give them the floor 
So this is one issue. The second issue, uh, I was not sur surprised of the result of this poll. Uh, I agree with my colleague from Greece that uh, uh, probably two or three years ago it will be much more uh, worse uh, result of this kind of poll and analysis. But uh, I think that we need to focus on on some additional issues, not only on uh, uh, legislation, because I think that in the European Union now, uh, uh, this is a very strong uh, feeling that if we will implement uh, the new legislative frameworks addressed to artificial intelligence, addressed to DSA, DMA and so on, so the situation will be changed. Not that there are important uh, factors, but at the same time we need to discuss about investment, that it was done, and we need to discuss about uh, 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 management uh, of uh, cooperation, uh, as it was done uh, during the discussion about uh, European cloud and the uh, decision that it should be signed not only by member states, European Commission, but also some European companies. So we have some additional steps to make, uh, uh, to go forward and to fight with our uh, 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 competitors as US and, uh, uh, and China is. And on the other hand, we made a very big step working on GDPR, and now GDPR is a reference, global reference point in some issues. If we will create for artificial intelligence some balanced solutions, not to, uh, 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 without any additional special burdens, but with uh, uh, protection of people and fundamental and consumer rights. So I think we will create the new uh, uh, reference point uh, uh, at this era, which is crucial for the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Wilden, you wanted to say something about the poll as well? Ah, sorry, we just can't hear you. Maybe you're on mute. Apologies. Uh, uh, I rather agree with um, Constantinus there that, that the uh, actually that's not a bad outcome, and that it would have been a lot uh, a lot lower uh, just a few years ago. And, and I do think that's in part because we in Europe have grabbed the agenda, and we recognise that we need some unique European solutions to some of these problems. We've covered a lot of ground this morning, from everything from the level playing field through to access to capital, through to skills. But ultimately, Europe requires a European solution to these things, and we can set the we can set the agenda. I think you know access to capital, for example, is something that uh, isn't is, is is different at different stages of of, of startup cycles. Um, Europe's actually got a pretty decent record of providing capital to to startups. We then struggle as we get towards unicorn stage, and we don't have a particularly liquid um, uh, capital markets for exit, which is one of the issues I think um, that some of the entrepreneurial uh, 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 startups find um, a real challenge. I think in skills, actually, um, uh, Constantinos actually gave a long list in his opening talk of, of, the, of the fantastic um, institutions in Europe that we have that are leading the way in, in technology skills. And that is undoubtedly the case. Um, I, 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 technology skills are so varied, though, that um, imagining that we can, can find sort of one single competitor to the Stanfords of this world, I think, is, is unlikely. Actually, I think what we have to build on is the, is the, the differences that we've already got that can uh, meet the various different, different challenges of the different parts of the digital economy. And then finally, you know, I think um, on, on the regulatory world, um, you, you know, Michael is absolutely right. Europe has led the way on things like GDPR, and um, and can lead the way on 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 AI. And I hope will lead the way on um, on on responsibility and liability, and indeed on on some of the big um, market uh, uh, economic issues. What we have to do is recognise that we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The, the importance of retaining European uh, intellectual property in Europe, the importance of recognising that we can have a level playing field on our terms and set the agenda for the world, uh, and the importance of building on our own cultural um, strengths that already exist. And so I think there's a, I think I'm pretty optimistic, and I would hope that in five years' time, those numbers are, on that poll are easily reversible. 
Thank you for that five years time reference because uh, I'm going to come up to that in a minute. But first I want to go back to Mr. Pantelides because Mr. Bonnie was uh, talking about 5G infrastructure and this is obviously a very important topic as well. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about where Europe stands on 5G and how the continent can secure um, in a timely and financial viable rollout basically of this vital infrastructure and if you'd give us your, your light on this. Sure. So uh, my co-panelists have brought up some very, very important issues uh, when it comes to infrastructure and connectivity is a key part of the digital value, value chain and plays a mega huge role when it comes to turning EU uh, into a global leader. Uh, I can really confirm the strategic nature of this high-speed uh, infrastructure, uh, communication infrastructure. Uh, as we observed, a 20 to 50 traffic percent traffic growth in the first few months. Um, information: We have the European 5G Observatory that releases reports quite regularly, and the reports show that by the end of September 2020, member states were very heavily involved in testing already. So we had 199 trials reported at that time. Uh, deployments are ongoing with tens to tens of hundreds of base stations to be switched on in many European cities. I should note that Germany, for example, already has more than 1,000 5G base stations in operation. And at least uh, 18 countries, so that's EU member states and the UK, uh, already are enjoying commercial 5G. Uh, when we turn to what we're doing when it comes to security, well, we've had a lot of breakthroughs uh, in things that perhaps uh, were once considered EU uh, uh, member state competencies. So um, the Commission earlier on this year endorsed uh, the 5G toolbox. Uh, we adopted a communication on implementing the EU 5G. Uh, EU toolbox for secure 5G deployment in the EU. Um, a lot of progress has already been achieved when it comes to 5G security. National regulate, regulatory authorities have reinforced powers to regulate 5G security. Measures were put in place to the involvement of suppliers based on their risk profile under this toolbox. Um, as next steps, we will continue to monitor the toolbox implementation. We will promote the alignment of national approaches uh, through further exchanges of information and experiences, and by working with BEREC, which is the body of European regulators uh, for electronic communications. Okay. Thank you. Actually, I heard we have a question on Facebook, so I'm asking my colleague Anna to take the floor again and let us know what she's read on Facebook. Uh, yes, indeed, we have a comment from an online viewer, Ward Sutsen, who is bringing up the upcoming digital desert spreading amongst the elderly in Europe. So what he's stating is that if deals could be made with providers on a European base, lowering the financial threshold for the silver generation, that could give an economic boost to online shopping, banking, and so on. So if your speakers have any comments on that. Thank you. Okay, well, that's an interesting question. The silver generation was, is someone interested in taking this particular question on how to allow access to our older generations so that they don't feel behind, uh, feel left behind basically in the digital transition that the continent is undergoing? Mr. Boni, please feel free. Oh, <coughs> I'm the representative of silver generation. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's very important, of course. And uh, we need also to remember about uh, those digital programs, actions, as inclusive for all generations. So when we are discussing about digital literacy, we need to focus, of course, on uh, young generations, school programs, school curricula, uh, uh, also uh, on lifelong learning, but on the other hand, on uh, elderly generation, silver generation, with special programs, educational programs. It should be combined with the practical solutions which are done during the COVID, for example, because uh, uh, COVID, uh, uh, unfortunate COVID, create fortunate possibilities also for elderly people to contact with the world, to contact with another people using uh, digital channels. 
So I think that we need to prepare special programs addressed to them. And if I can add something uh, about in, in inclusive uh, uh, digital development in the European Union, we also need to develop 5G, as it was mentioned earlier, uh, um, um, for uh, um, making uh, uh, some solutions for uh, people from rural areas, because this is a big division between people with access to uh, uh, digital possibilities uh, and infrastructure uh, from uh, uh, cities, uh, big cities and small cities, but uh, 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 there are many problems with the rural areas. So inclusiveness is one of the key issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, actually, for tying it back in with 5G, because I think this is a critical issue. And that's why I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Kiranakis from a national legislator's point of view, is this as well something that's, you know, worrying for you uh, in Greece? Do you, uh, are you thinking of solutions on how is the 5G infrastructure looking, first of all, in Greece? And of course, then, how are you including the older generations into uh, getting up to, up to speed? Yes, thank you, Anna. Um, we actually passed legislation on 5G about a month ago, and uh, one of the innovations that uh, we have uh, came up with here in Greece, and uh, I hope it's going to work, um, is a 5G uh, state fund that we're going to create. Uh, it's going to be called Festos. So the Festos fund um, will take money from the auctions of the 5G frequencies and um, will invest in Greek or European companies that uh, will focus on 5G infrastructure. So we hope that um, uh, in the upcoming years, Greece can be a pioneer in uh, developing 5G, um, in using 5G technologies, because I again agree with Mr. Boni on what he said about rural areas. Here in Greece, we have the complexity uh, of the islands. So um, if 5G technologies allow us to use um, better telemedicine services, uh, health health services on smaller islands in the Aegean Sea uh, are crucial for the people that have no access um, in, in central services. And we think that 5G technologies can help um, in, uh, in a substantial way to solve this kind of problems. So, um, of course, uh, I think we need to address the debate um, that have been raised by Michael Kratzios, who is the uh, CEO of the White House, uh, who has went on uh, on many conferences speaking uh, about the, the 5G strategy coming from China and the, the Huawei 5G networks. I think Europe needs to be very careful uh, when it comes to uh, negotiating terms uh, with uh, Chinese companies. We have no access uh, to transparency about how these companies are governed and how the the data of European citizens could be used uh, from a, a company that basically uh, belongs to the Chinese uh, communist state. And, and therefore, I think uh, Europe needs to lead the way um, and, and help European companies build 5G infrastructures instead of, uh, of being, um, uh, of relying on American or Chinese companies or, or anyone else. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's quite a comprehensive answer. I was wondering, do any, uh, do Mr. Pantelides or Mr. Wilden want to bounce on this question of 5G and the silver generation at all? Because I'm slowly otherwise going to wrap up this panel as we're reaching the end of, the, of our time. Um, in that case, I have, coming back to the Slido poll, this is a rapid fire question. So I would like your answers in 30 seconds tops, if possible. If I re-pose the question of the Slido poll, but in five years from now, from your personal uh, experience and opinion, given what we talked about today, meaning um, the ambitions of the European Commission hopefully coming to fruition but in five years from now, the national member states getting serious as well about uh, digital issues and showing this in the MFF, do you think in five years from now, Europe is more competitive in the digital global race? You each have 30 seconds to answer. And I'm going to start with Mr. Boni. I would like um, uh, to say that it is possible, but I think that there are uh, uh, some factors. Firstly, avoid fragmentation, because this is very, very dangerous for us. And on the other hand, to treat all digital solutions 
in holistic way. It means uh, not to uh, focus only on digital sector, but uh, understand that digital uh, solutions and digital instruments are in all sectors of our uh, life and, of course, of the economy. Mm -hmm. Perfect. 30 seconds. That's great. Uh, Mr. Kiranakis, do you want to take the floor? Yes, thank you. So uh, my answer is yes, and uh, I would like to, uh, in 30 seconds, uh, try to explain how. So number one, uh, Europe needs to strategically invest uh, in European companies that have the potential of reaching fast uh, a global audience. So as I said before, connect them with industries that in Europe are already strong, like automotive, financial services, oil and gas, or tourism. Number two, uh, educate European kids on technologies of the future. And if we're talking about five years from now and not 10 years from now, uh, also invest um, in a tech university, a European tech university. Number three, create a modern and flexible, harmonized legal framework that will allow any tech company, European or non-European, to operate much better uh, here than anywhere else in the world. We need to uh, leave behind the, uh, the logic that we have in Europe about protecting again and again and, and uh, move towards a more invested investing-oriented um, mindset. Perfect. Thank you. That's, those are very th clear three points. Mr. Pantelides, do you want to step up? Thanks. Um, I'd, I'd first off uh, start by saying uh, it is possible. Um, we, we need to look into numerous of the things that my co-panelists have mentioned. So when it comes to skills, we need to uh, implement actions under the Digital Education Action Plan. Um, we need to consider the strategic areas in our digital value chain. So we need to look at hardware and high-performance high computing, and we're, we're doing this. Uh, we need to look at microelectronics uh, by fully utilizing and maximizing uh, uh, important projects of common European interest. We need to boost connectivity, which is the backbone to the digital, uh, digital economy. And we need to look at software. So that's AI development, deployment, cloud solutions, data availability and usage through common European data spaces that will also boost, for example, our health infrastructures. Um, I think I'll just finish by uh, touching upon the fact that when it, when it comes to funding, uh, we, we are doing quite, quite a bit in this respect. Uh, most recently, we have, uh, most importantly, especially now, um, through the coronavirus uh, response, we have the Recovery and Resilience Facility, and the uh, Commission has proposed to at least 20% uh, of funds under this. Uh, to go towards a digital transition, uh, which would equal approximately 134.5 billion overall. This money needs, absolutely needs to be invested in digital uh, priorities such as connectivity, R&D, human capital, e-government and digitalization of business. Uh, this is now in the member states' hands. The German presidency of the Council uh, of the EU has the mandate to negotiate with the EP uh, and it's now in the hands of member states uh, to uh, continue these steps. All right, great. And Mr. Wielden, would you like to have the final word on this question? Ah, again, I think you're on mute. <laughs> the cardinal error. <laughs> um, I like the final word, thank you, even if uh, sometimes I'm accidentally on mute. Look, I think that if we focus on uh, leveling the playing field, if we focus on retaining and protecting Europe's intellectual property, if we have a plan to build on skills, and if we build, if we base an industrial policy, particularly around infrastructure, uh, on effective competition, and let's not forget how competition has helped to drive investment over many decades in Europe then I'm confident that in five years' time, that poll is going to look something like 70-30 in favour of our ability to compete globally, uh, rather than where we see today. All right. Thank you so much, uh, all four of you, and of course, Mr. Echeverria in absentia. Um, let's do this again in five years and see if we change our conclusions. Uh, I think this was pretty clear. I want to thank our online audience for their very persuasive questions, very good Slido answers as well. We should redo this Slido as well in five years from now. And I'm going to give the floor back now to my colleague Anna. Thank you. 
Thank you, Anna. What an excellent debate. Ladies and gentlemen, after this panel discussion, we were supposed to have an exclusive interview with the EPP president, Donald Tusk, but unfortunately, he cannot join us for health-related reasons. We wish him, of course, a very speedy recovery. So at this point, dear audience, please join us for an extended break, and we will see each other again in one hour for the last panel of the forum. Tune in at 12.
dear guests, welcome back. We have arrived to the last panel discussion of the Economic Ideas Forum, the age of artificial intelligence and disruptive technologies, reimagining regulation and society. To keep the debate lively, I invite you to use the hashtag EIF20 on social media by leaving your comments and questions, and we'll pose you the last slide poll of the day with the code EIF20. Is the rise of artificial intelligence a positive or negative development? We look forward to our last panelists shedding the light on these important topics. And for that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the fourth and last discussion, Policy Director of the Martin Center, Roland Freundestein. Roland, over to you. Thank you, Anna. And welcome to everyone to this last panel of EIF20. We have now discussed sustainability and the Green Deal. We've discussed trade and uh, the pitfalls of uh, international economic exchange. We have discussed the digital sphere and the conundrums of liberty, and privacy and, credibility and creativity. And now we're coming to the topic where arguably the hopes and fears of mankind arguably lie most closely together. And that is probably because it reaches most deeply into our collective subconscious, artificial intelligence. So, Machines Who Think, that was actually the title of a, a textbook I used in the 1980s studying in, ca in California. Um, so, robots, computers, self-driving cars, um, and autonomous weapon systems, to name but a few. And let's remember one thing, that AI, in one form or the other, has been the stuff of legends, of myths, of dreams, of nightmares, of utopias and dystopias alike, basically since antiquity. The new thing in the last couple of years, maybe 20 years, is that it has also quickly become the stuff of legislation, of economics and the labor market, and of great power competition. So, I'd like to introduce our speakers uh, who have joined us for this. Uh, we start with Eva Maidel, a uh, member of the European Parliament from the EPP group. We have Alexander Stubb, um, a former Prime Minister of Finland and director, currently director of the School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute of Florence. Um, we have Daniel Schoenberger, the head of legal services in Switzerland and Austria of Google. Uh, we have Joanna Bryson, professor of ethics and technology at the Hetty School of Governance in Berlin. And last but not least, Giga Turk, professor at the University of Ljubljana, former member of the Slovenian government and a member of the Academic Council of the Martin Center. So thank you all for joining. Just some house rules now to start with. We agreed to initially stick to three to four minutes for the kickoff statements for every speaker. And then we can have follow up questions from me and or a mutual conversation among the speakers. And of course, there will be space for Q&A from the audience. Not to forget the Slido question that Anna just already mentioned in the intro. And now. Before we turn to the big philosophical questions, I'd like to explore some of the aspects closer to home. In other words, the EU and AI, our approach in Brussels, Strasbourg and the national capitals. And for this, I'd like to turn to Eva Maidel first. So the question to you would be, is Europe ready for AI? Does the Commission white paper on artificial intelligence, strike the right balance between regulation and development. Over to you, Eva. Good afternoon, very happy to be joining this uh, panel. Um, well, I am often called to say that Europe doesn't do anything uh, by itself or alone. I think Europe is as ready as its citizens are. So what we do as European institutions is either driven or is urged by its citizens. And I think that a year and a half ago, when we had the European elections, citizens very clearly uh, basically stated that they would like to see a European Union that looks forward and not 
backwards, a European Union that makes sure um, that we uh, help our societies, but our businesses and enterprises as well uh, in the long run of uh, being more competitive, um, producing um, better opportunities, uh, enabling our citizens and our businesses. And one way to do that is using technologies. So I will have three points that I would like to, to in order to answer your question. One is based on leadership and the second one is based more on some actionable points uh, by those leaders. And finally, uh, what the European Parliament is doing in terms of uh, solutions. So I think that What's really key uh, for us to see is that over the past 10 years or so, uh, the technology topic has been, uh, in a way, on the agenda of uh, uh, key leaders. Uh, but I often am caught to say in um, settings such as this one that I still think that we actually need real digital leadership, more digital leaders uh, in Europe. What would that mean? I mean, it would be very nice if we have uh, prime ministers and ministers that called, and maybe we, we do have some, um, but what is more important is that these are leaders that embrace technology and they're able to deliver with actionable uh, projects and uh, decision makings. So we would like to see uh, digital leaders that could provide provide uh, through their um, vision um, a secure, um, a protective uh, way of, of dealing with privacy uh, and data, but also an enabling way of delivering um, to our citizens uh, those uh, technologies. Um, I think that a number of leaders today in Europe have understood that uh, digital solutions, and in particular also AI, uh, can enable us uh, to go through certain uh, challenges that we face or to make us more uh, competitive. So in this respect, when it comes to the more actionable points, uh, we can see that the white paper uh, that was put forward to the Commission, it in a way it ticks all the right boxes. It's a good, it's a good start. Uh, it speaks about data, it speaks about um, innovation, it focuses particularly on SMEs and skills, but also on the development of trustworthy uh, AI ecosystem and most importantly also addresses certain societal uh, risk. So what is uh, key there is that it, it, it's on a paper, right? Uh, we are expecting to see uh, some more legislative uh, action, uh, but what is important is that the, this AI buzz um, turns uh, back uh, to being a buzz into the institutions, whether they're member states institutions or European institutions, and creates some action. Uh, so projects that are related into solving societal uh, issues uh, and problems. Uh, pro projects uh, that are using very well uh, all the um, funding that we are currently discussing, be it the budget or the recovery uh, fund, uh, that will enable us to progress and, and not just stay where we were uh, a year or two ago or where we are today. I think we've missed an opportunity 10 years ago to kind of advance our economies and push them even further by enabling key technologies. So we cannot currently sit and compare ourselves to other nations or to companies that uh, have uh, been um, prosperous and started um, and, and, and started themselves outside of Europe and just want to replicate that. I think we need to think in a different dimension. Uh, where are we strong? And one uh, area where we are very strong is producing industrial data, for example. So why not harness that potential and build on it and be able to deliver um, solutions that would help our businesses um, and our societies? So in this respect, um, what the European European Parliament is currently doing is um, we are trying to understand um, and address the current challenges that businesses and society uh, are facing in deploying uh, AI. And so this is why we have set up a special committee on artificial intelligence uh, in the digital uh, age. 
uh, for which I'm the speaker for the EPP group, where we would like to uh, make sure that this committee is like the, the forum, the place on a European level, uh, where we will be discussing the future trends to come and those future trends that would help uh, our uh, companies actually uh, harness the potential of data and be able uh, to, to deploy new type of solutions to increase their productivity, uh, for example. Um, so um, we very much hope uh, that it would be a committee not to focus on issues we've been discussing over the past five or ten years, but it would be a committee that would uh, work on the next cutting edge legislation uh, that would not necessarily be focused on restricting, but it would be focusing on enabling our uh, economies and societies uh, to grow and to prosper. Thank you. Thanks, Eva. Um, I have a follow up question. Surprise, maybe. <laughs> um, if you talk about enabling, how much of this is on content and on solutions offered by institutions, be it the European institutions or, uh, or national ones? Um, and how much is sheer money is a, 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 a kind of concerted effort to, 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 to catch up, for Europe to catch up, uh, in comparison to competitors in China and the US, for example. I mean, what's the mix here between um, concepts and between resources? Well, so first of all, I think institutions have to lead by example. So we cannot just be preaching and saying what the business should be doing or society should be doing. I think we also need to show that we could use um, uh, effectively technologies uh, that could help and support our work. And that is not just setting up a Zoom or a WebEx or some other type of account. Uh, it is going beyond that. And we already have worked with a number of also researchers and businesses that could show how much we can enable the workings of institutions um, if we actually enforce certain uh, AI um, um, solutions into our daily, uh, daily works. Um, so that's on one hand. On the other hand is we currently have um, a, a, a package that's being discussed with, with an amount that is um, never been on the table before um, in Europe. So we need to make sure that we use it in a very uh, forward-looking and sensi sensible way. And as I said, on one hand, it's important to compare ourselves where we are. We need to know where Europe is currently standing in the global competition and that we are lagging behind on certain developments. And we need to see whether those investments are done, whether future investments could be done in the right way in order for Europe um, to also lead the way. So I would like to um, see a more, um, so to say, a unified vision in a way uh, where possible, because if each country invests in a completely different sphere and area, it would be way more difficult for us to, to advance in our technological uh, development in the next couple of years. Um, so a little bit more vision on a European level would help. We had a European Council meeting that provided some I would say more concrete conclusions than, than we've witnessed before when it comes to um, enabling uh, technologies. Uh, but ideally we have a council meeting just focused on uh, the technological advancement uh, in Europe. I think that we have pressing issues such as um, the health crisis or migration. Um, we should put uh, at the advancement of technologies almost at the same level because um, my question to you, Roland, would be why did you decide to have the technological panel at the end? At this uh, economic ideas forum because I in a way believe that in order for us to have the progress we want to see and achieve this very ambitious aim uh, related to the Green Deal for example we need to have the innovation and technologies to do so um, so without this I think it will be very more, way more difficult for us to um, manage risk or to foresee um, certain challenges coming our way um, and technologies could definitely make us way more uh, prepared and, 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 and agile uh, for future challenges and yeah, issues. Th thank you. Thank you, Eva. And thank you also for the question. Of course, one might always ask whether the most important stuff should come first or should come last as a result <laughs> of the other debates. So uh, that, um, that I leave that to future uh, uh, fora, fora uh, uh, in, in the Martin Center. But anyway, um, let me now turn to Alexander Stubb and ask him, um, 
you know, if if as Eva said, it, it, it's all about a unified approach, about leadership and leading by example, um, uh, but but also about well enabling uh, through providing solutions. Then, in your view, is the recovery uh, fund uh, that we're now discussing uh, is the upcoming budget? the multi-annual financial framework of the European Union reflecting these priorities. Is there enough money? Are there enough resources for uh, artificial intelligence and the other top technologies that we're talking about here? Over yeah, to thanks you. for the question, Roland, and thanks for having me as well. I guess the short answer to your question is no. There's never going to be enough uh, money put down on uh, issues linked to the digital revolution. But in many ways, I think things are uh, relative. So the first answer is to say that the recovery fund and uh, the MFF would only be a partial solution in trying to generate uh, the digital uh, revolution in one way uh, or another. Uh, of course, I think the focus should be very much on innovation and research and development and what unfortunately, as so many times before we saw with the MFF negotiations and the recovery fund was that when the horse trading took place last minute, we saw quite a radical drop actually in R&D money and money linked to innovation and the move more towards uh, direct grants. So I guess the answer is no, but it is a, a good beginning. Now, you know, I'm very much with Eva on this, as so often before. I think one of the we have in Europe at the moment in the debate is that we're fighting old battles. So, you know, we get involved in this debate about, hmm, you know, uh, on for Fortune 500, the top 40 IT, uh, IT companies are either Chinese or American. Uh, you know, there are no European companies which are forging the way ahead or are pioneering in this. Look, we don't have uh, Google, we don't have Amazon, uh, we, don't, we didn't do Facebook, we didn't do Twitter, we didn't do Instagram, we didn't do Snapchat, uh, we didn't even do TikTok, we didn't do WeChat, we don't have Alibaba, you know, we, we, we're doomed. Uh, and I think this is a very old-fashioned way of, of doing it, but, you know, the digital revolution is, by definition, extremely agile and extremely quick. So that means that you really have to think ahead. Now, what should we do? I, I think what we did in the 1990s was to look ahead. I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the Bangeman report. Eva probably is not. But that was about telecoms. And then what we ended up doing, of course, was having a common 3G standard at the time, which forged us ahead of the Americans uh, in the so-called digital revolution. Uh, at that time. Of course, it was a time when Nokia was born, Ericsson was born, and many others as well. And then we sort of got a little bit lazy, um, I think, and, and thought that, hey, we've, we've got this, we've got this. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the Americans who had had uh, 50 different uh, internal markets on, on telecoms were left behind. Well, I, I think we, we, we really shouldn't be sort of how would I say, crying over the fact that uh, the U.S. came up with Google and the rest of it. We need to look at things ahead. And I'll finish off with, with two points. For me, first of all, uh, this is about a, a balance. It's about a balance between three things, regulation, competition, and finance. And remember that the European Union is a regulatory superpower. Uh, remember that the European Commission has exclusive competence on competition, in other words, on antitrust. And remember that right now there seems to be resources which we could use to, to finance. So that's what the public sector can kind of do. But my second point is, is probably more a point of principle. And I, I think that the, the European Union leaders need to focus on, on, on three things. First, start, and this is, you know, I'm glad there is a committee in the European Parliament that is looking to the future rather than the past. But, you know, try to suss out the new areas. And, and you know, Ursula von der Leyen's uh, State of the Union speech, there were some, I think, new areas that were outlined. So look, for instance, at biotech. So when you start combining biology and technology, 
when us, the human beings, become some form of cyborgs, not only because we're on our phones all the time, but also when we start getting neural laces, you know, what can we find uh, in that extremely interesting field, which has a lot to do about the future of Homo sapiens? Look at data. If it's the new gold, if it's the new oil, uh, how are we going to deal with that? I know a lot of people laughed at the GDPR, uh, but they didn't laugh anymore after Cambridge uh, Analytica. What can we do on 5G? How about the semiconductor industry, where I think actually the Chinese are lagging behind and are desperately trying to get their own mechanism uh, working? So there are just a few areas. Secondly, regulate smartly. I do think that one of the key issues that we're going to see in the future is what you mentioned, Roland, artificial intelligence, and especially the ethical slash moral uh, aspect of it. And I'm very glad that the European Commission has already for years been working on human-centric uh, AI. And the question is, you know, who is going to set the rules uh, on things linked to artificial intelligence and things linked to the combination of biology and technology. For me, this is a little bit like the Human Rights Convention 75 years ago. We need to start looking at rules and regulation on how it's going to work. And I somehow don't see any better place to do it uh, than Europe, the European Union, perhaps inside the UN together with, with, with countries with similar values, because I'd much rather the good guys do the algorithms than the bad guys. The third and final uh, focus that I think we should have is to understand that the technological revolution is also deeply embedded uh, into foreign policy and, and geopolitics. And the way in which I see it, we have three power blocks emerging. One is China with its own system, its own philosophy. Let's even start stop pretending that China is ever going to turn into a traditional Western-style liberal democracy. The way in which it's going to drive the technological revolution, if the axis is between digital dictatorship and, and digital democracy, it's going to be more on the control side. Uh, the second block is obviously the United States, uh, and I think they are and should continue to be a close ally of ours. And the third one is how we deal with this ourselves. Uh, so I'm glad that there's a lot of awareness, and I'm glad that it's one of the top three projects of the European Commission. I don't think we are too late. I think just we need to look ahead. That's going to be the key in all of this, Roland. Thank you. Thanks, Alexander. Just one brief follow-up here. Uh, you mentioned China, and it's going to be rather on the control side. You mentioned Europe as kind of being almost the antipode, maybe together with the US, to that approach. How do we get the Chinese to actually jump on our bandwagon? And uh, 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 how do we get them to, to rather uh, adopt our uh, uh, rules of the game? I think they will have to adopt our rules of the game outside Chinese borders, but we should stop pretending that this will happen inside. If you look at different applications that are linked to social ranking, for instance, in China at the moment. So, for instance, you use an app and based on your behavior, um, your health records, your food shopping, um, your travel, your, your exercise, uh, you start looking at different ways in which insurance is being dealt with and whether you're a good citizen or a bad citizen. So that's not going to happen. And I think uh, the Chinese are going to create and have already created very much their own system, whether it's on WeChat, whether it's based on Alibaba or, or anything of, 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 of that sort. But I think what we need to make sure is that once the Chinese go uh, over their borders, for instance, when they're doing the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and others that they play by by our rules. Uh, you know, the Confucius model is, is quite different from the fairly individualistic model that we have in, in Europe. So we should stop pretending that they're going to um, adapt our system. That's why I think our best bet is to work closely with the Americans, uh, not against them. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alexander. And let me now turn to Daniel Schönberger. Uh, and, and just refer to your, the recent visit in Brussels of your CEO, Mr. Pichai, uh, who called for specific governmental regulation on AI. Now, having in mind that um, uh, big tech companies such as Google uh, were initially fighting European legislation when it came to GDPR, how does that uh, balance out? And is big tech happy? 
with the efforts of the European Union on AI. Thanks so much for, for having me. I'm really glad that I can contribute to this uh, very interesting panel. So is, is big tech happy? Well, let me uh, put it that way. As you had mentioned some months ago, uh, Google CEO Sundar Pichai visiting Brussels made it very clear that AI is simply too important to not regulate it. Um, the challenge, of course, is to do this in a way that is proportionate and does not unduly hinder innovation. Um, obviously, we are seeing extremely disruptive times at the moment, and uh, Google strongly believes in the positive contributions that AI can make in Europe and, and also to its businesses. Uh, this includes, in particular, uh, the current COVID-19 situation where AI can help in many ways, for example, in boosting knowledge sharing, uh, contributing to research for a cure, and then more long-term also in driving economic uh, recovery of all the businesses. Uh, at the same time, of course, some properties of AI technologies, they do present new challenges that deserve further scrutiny indeed, for example, in terms of unfair bias or their uh, potential for abuse. That said, the question is probably not so much uh, whether big tech, whatever that means, by the way, uh, is happy, um, but rather uh, about what is good for a society at large. So on a, on a general note, we uh, welcome the uh, Commission's uh, dual approach for the ecosystem of excellence on the one side and the ecosystem of trust. Uh, conceptually, we also agree with the Commission's direction on a focus uh, and the focus on so-called high-risk AI. However, uh, there are some areas uh, where we think uh, that greater clarification and a more proportionate and uh, targeted uh, approach would be mandated. In particular, we think it's important to get the scoping and the definitions right in the first place. We worry that some equate uh, AI with algorithms or want regulation for all AI applications. We believe that the focus should be on the latest advances in machine learning and uh, on applications with uh, high risk profiles only. Also, it is vital that any risk assessment um, uh, takes a holistic view, reflecting not only potential harms, but also societal benefits. Um, higher risk AI applications often present a huge improvement over the status quo. Thus, we think that the opportunity cost of not using AI uh, should be factored in and, and given significant weight in that whole uh, debate. Um, concerning the mandatory requirements uh, considered for high-risk AI, we urgently ask the European legislator to refrain from making uh, the rules too prescriptive. Uh, regulation should still be flexible enough to accommodate future, uh, future innovation. Uh, ultimately, what matters is uh, that the technologies are fair and safe, and that they respect fundamental rights, and this can be achieved in, in various ways. Uh, equally, we would caution against uh, too far-reaching information and records keeping obligations uh, that could create privacy and security issues and uh, also clash with um, trade secrets and intellectual property rights. As far as enforcement is concerned, we would support ex post enforcement uh, as the most pro uh, proportionate and, and practical mechanism. If the EU insists on ex ante enforcement, we strongly call against uh, third-party assessments or even uh, upfront approvals and would recommend instead self-assessment uh, procedures based on very clear due diligence uh, guidance. And finally, we worry about the potential direction the EU could take uh, with regard to the liability rules for AI. So far, there's simply no evidence suggesting um, that the existing liability framework is broken. Uh, and overly rigid liability rules could easily disincentivize innovation in space. And on a closing note, I would just like to emphasize that Google introduced its own set of AI principles already two and a half years ago. Uh, these principles put human and fundamental rights, safety, and also accountability center stage. And they also set out uh, so-called red lines and thus AI applications Google uh, will not pursue. In any case, we are here as, as partner uh, in this uh, legislative process, and I would like to thank you again for the opportunity to share um, some of our thoughts with you today. 
Thanks, Daniel. Um, so summarizing here at this point, regulation, absolutely, but not when it impedes development and innovation. Actually, it rather should enhance development and innovation. And the second point I'd like to highlight here, um, it's very important that we're not discussing for individual companies um, or, or individual uh, countries. We're discussing about what is best for everyone. And I think that was a very important point you, you made, Daniel. Now, let me turn to Joanna Bryson from Berlin. Um, do you think the EU will be successful in getting other countries to adopt its ethical standards in artificial intelligence. We had a little bit of this in the China debate uh, uh, that I had with Alexander a while ago, but would you please uh, explore on this? Okay, all right. I hope you can hear me. Thanks so much for having me on this panel. This has been great. Uh, I, I'm really thrilled to totally disagree with at least two of the speakers. <laughs> so um, the... Uh, can, can we be successful? You know, when Google was writing its AI uh, uh, policies, I was actually in the policy center in London quite a lot talking to them about that. And people were telling me, you know, the GDPR, nobody's going to do business in Europe anymore. And I didn't only hear that from Google. Let's not just name one company. I heard that from multiple big tech companies up to the deadline. And they were there the next day. The EU has successfully shown how we can lead the world by just saying, hey, you want access to our citizens? Then you have to play by our rules, right? And then people were saying to me, oh, we can't believe this. The GDPR, like, okay, but now it's so easy to do business in, in Europe. It's like, we're a trading block. It was set up to make us more economically successful. And now big tech is again pushing back on this. So as someone who's been uh, uh, recommending, someone just got pushed back on, I just really want to uh, point out some of these consequences. I think it's a bad idea to say, oh, what's high risk? It's a novel application of a new machine learning algorithm. No, nobody saw that liking kittens was high risk, okay? <laughs> we need to absolutely keep records and have accountability like any other sector. Right and and big tech, uh, not big tech. Look, AI is already well regulated within, for example, automotive. Right, when there's a crash, we can go back and find out what happened. We have those records, and you know, Microsoft is not so worried about transparency. They have transparency centers where governments, not academics, incidentally, for whatever reason, we're kept out. But governments are able to go in and say, hey, is there a cyber attack going on? What's going on right now? Is it your software? What's the problem? We need this kind of inspection. Pharma has 10 times the IP that tech has. And, uh, and they still have government inspection. We have to have trusted brokers so that we can benefit everybody. And I think that you can absolutely lead in these ways by just making common sense rules as we did with the GDPR. So I, 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 yes, I think we can do this. I think we will be attacked. Um, and, but I think one of the real incredible tools we have is that we have figured out ways to uh, collaborate between diverse companies to harmonize companies, sorry, countries. And we do need to collaborate. I, I don't want to make big tech out to be, or whatever it means, I agree with whatever that means. Uh, so I didn't do everything. Um, we do need to figure out how to collaborate with these large institutions that have grown up. I want, I did really agree with a lot of the things that Amy was saying at the beginning, that uh, we, we, uh, we, we do have these strengths and we, we do have, uh, I'm sorry, I'm digressing slightly. I, I, I want to have one more thing because I realize I'm here in the five minutes. Uh, we are not going to be, it's not going to be just the EU. There's going to be a lot of other countries. I've done a big study just recently that hopefully will be coming out too soon without, before too long, but I can already share the data that about this market cap thing, about innovation, what's happening where in the world. You know, we have more patents than China has. In the EEA, excluding uh, UK and Switzerland. Where is all the market cap? It's in Switzerland. Why? I don't know. Right, But market cap is a weird thing. It is a form of power when we allow companies to have that much. 
which is probably why the EU doesn't allow companies to get to the position that, that Google is in now. But Google has created incredible public goods, right? They have a fiber optic uh, network that circles the entire world. They have their own chip manufacturing. They have cybersecurity that, frankly, the EU cannot produce right now. We do not have uh, a chip, uh, the capacity for chip manufacturing. So um, I think we, we really need to be thinking about what are the roles of governments? You know, have they changed now that there are uh, companies offering these services? Or should we allow companies to have like this incredible amassment of power that isn't directly related to what is actually their core technologies or where they're actually deriving the money? So they have like this really weird things happening. So how do we work together as companies to help us deal? Oh, and another thing, this, this assault on China. You know, the, the, all the governments of the world are not necessarily reflecting the desires of the majority of their, of their citizens. And we've seen uh, backsliding, democratic backsliding in a lot of places. But the Chinese people also have been really good at, I mean, surprisingly good given their context, at protesting and, and reducing some of the invasions of pri uh, privacy happening there too. So we need to be thinking about the whole world and we need to be thinking about how do we find ways to guide both governments and corporations to things that actually protect all of us. And I think the EU has been a great template. We have to keep improving, but we have to look at helping other nations form hubs and networks like this too, and maybe also other corporations. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Joanna. Since you in initially in your response uh, uh, made a couple of remarks in the direction of big tech, Daniel, if you want to respond briefly to this, please, you have one minute at this point. I, I can do so very briefly. I mean, the, the most important thing I would say here is that they're not really pushing back on regulation. As I said, it's too important to not regulate. And we uh, submitted quite an extensive brief in response to the white paper where we make very detailed um, suggestions how you could proceed with regulation that would be smart as we had heard it before that would not hamper uh, innovation too much and i would uh, simply invite everyone who's interested uh, in, in learning more about the details um, to to read these these submissions they're online and you certainly find it using the search engine of your trust and choice. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now let's turn to Giga, Giga Turk. Um, and for you, I, I've kept the most all encompassing question of the kickoff statements here. Will the rise of artificial intelligence enable free individuals or rather big government? Over to you. Um, thank you, Roland. First of all, um, I'm very happy to be in such a great company in uh, such a great panel. Um, the short answer to your question is it depends, and I will explain why it depends and on what it depends. Now, my background, as you know, is in engineering, and AI is used a lot in my field to diagnose bridges, buildings, to do designs, evaluate designs, and so on. And if we demystify this whole story about AI, what it is really good at it is to find uh, patterns and learn from those patterns. So if patterns are there, AI will discover it. And you, basically, you cannot prevent it from doing so. And it works extremely well in uh, narrow fields. Uh, it's easy to make it work well in narrow fields. Uh, but you know that joke when a robot and human were playing chess uh, in a house that was burning down. And what the best possible move was, of course, for the robot playing chess, the best possible move was how to move the chess piece. And for the human, the best possible move was to run out of the house because the house is burning. So this brings us to this issue of uh, broader impacts um, of artificial intelligence. And actually, yes, this does go into the core of Western philosophy, economy, and also politics. And if we simplify um, a lot, about the different views of, on, on society, economy, and politics between, let's say, the West and East, um, we, can, we can probably all agree that societies thrive if, first, one can use as many brains as possible, and secondly, if you can establish collaboration among them. And the balance is here a little bit different. We believe a little bit more into using as many brains as possible, giving people individual freedom to explore, think, etc. 
And uh, in the East, they focus a little bit more on collaboration, on organizing these people to do something together. Now, we, of course, are in the history, in the um, economic history of economic liberalism of Mises and Hayek, and it is based on the idea that the sum of knowledge of all people is bigger than the knowledge that any central authority or any central planner could have. And this has been challenged many times with the advent of a technology. The assumption was that perhaps if the government had the supercomputing power that can crunch a lot of data, of course, also get a lot of data, if you would also add artificial intelligence to that, the scales would tilt to the government from the, let's say, from the people, from the businesses. And actually, this has been tried. This has been tried in Chile by Salvador, Salvador Allende in the 1970s. He had this project cyber scene. The idea was, well, let's let's create a government supercomputer that would steer the um, the um, economy. Um, now, the answer to this uh, uh, is actually very simple. If the government is not the only one that has access to AI power, uh, if uh, also businesses have access or citizens have access, then again, the sum of all AI tools, the sum of all of artificial intelligences out there will be bigger than the centralized artificial intelligence. Now, um, this, whether the sum of technology that is out there is bigger than the technology available to governments. That depends if that technology is democratically available. And this brings us to the issue of, of democracy and artificial intelligence. And um, in my view, dem de democracy is one of the ways, uh, currently the best way to enable the organization of peaceful collaboration among people. And this requires enforcement of some agreed rules. And by selecting the politicians that make the rules, we are quite likely to obey them. Now, my point related to your question is that the goal, the end goal um, of the whole story is not a free individual, but efficient collaboration. And in democracy, what people want is expressed so that they vote or take part in democratic institutions, they vote in elections, they take part in civil society. This gives the... Um, government's kind of input legitimacy. And actually, you could envision a scenario where big data and artificial intelligence would tell the government what people want better than the people know this themselves and, and express that by voting. And if people would be satisfied by that, this would give the, ruler, the rulers some kind of output legitimacy. And let's not pretend this is not happening. This is a little bit like Facebook recommending you what to read. Facebook does this better than you do this yourself. Of course, the danger is the abuse of such power. You could have a benevolent government artificial intelligence that knows everything, or you have um, you can have a malignant 1984 kind of digital authori authoritarianism. Um, the suppression, the governmental suppression of ideas, creativity, needs, wants, desires of all others. And the, I think the only tool against this, it's not rules so much, it's not regulations. The only weapon against it, not only of the monopoly of the governmental AI power, but also of the monopoly of one business's um, AI power, is the prevention of monopolizing the power of artificial intelligence. Um, and this brings my, my thought back to my engineering field and the history of engineering. Progress did not happen when some technology, um, like writing and copying books, when some technology was limited to an elite. Progress happened when it was available to everybody. So press, not parchment. And I think the most important thing is to have as many artificial intelligences as, as broadly distributed technology as much available to everybody um, as possible. It is just a tool and it empowers those with access to it. If the only ones with access are dictators, it will empower the dictators. If the only ones with access to it are big businesses, it will empower those. If the only ones are governments, it will empower those. So democratize artificial intelligence, give it to the, to the uh, people and to the businesses. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giga.
Um, I would like to turn to Anna now at this point. Do we have uh, a, a result of the Slido uh, poll and are there any other questions from Facebook? Thanks, Roland. Indeed we do. I suggest we have a look at the poll results first. We see we have a clear majority. So 76% of our audience think that indeed the rise of artificial intelligence is a positive development. I'd now like to move on to Facebook questions. We have a couple. The first one is from James Cantor. To what degree does success for Europe when it comes to the digital agenda and AI imply strategic autonomy for Europe? The second question from Bartolomé Cot. Should we regulate the usage of artificial intelligence in the electoral process, namely campaigning? So Roland, I leave those questions with you for further discussion. Okay, um, but two excellent questions. And as to the first one on strategic autonomy, ah, let's turn to Eva Maidel for a second, uh, and then and then maybe others that would like to that would volunteer to uh, to come in. Eva, what's your answer to this? Well, I mean, it's a strategic autonomy is again one of these buzzwords. I find. Um, and what we have to make sure is that we fill it with some substance. And the substance could actually come from the fact that we would, you know, lay out this, I used to call them shovel ready projects, uh, perhaps they're software ready projects, uh, better uh, to, to put them. Um, uh, we could fill it with substance only if we uh, start, um, you know, um, continuing uh, excelling in our productivity, for example, because I gave that as an example earlier um, in my in intro remarks. Um, so we could only, um, you know, fill it with substance if we are uh, to change uh, the, 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 the way uh, we are operating, both in in on the side of industry but also in society um so uh, strategic autonomy would would mean so many things um and it's good to put it there as a leadership instrument uh let's let's put it this way but on the other hand uh, we have to do our job we have to walk the talk um, and we have to do it with, with some substance. Uh, so uh, we would only be uh, able to achieve uh, it in certain areas uh, if we have a plan. And right now you would say, yes, as Europe, we actually do have a plan. We want, we know where we want to invest. We know where uh, the resources uh, should be going, but we need to follow up on that. Um, so it's one thing what the Brussels bubble says, and it's a different thing what member states are doing and what their priorities are. And it's a very um, tricky balance to achieve, uh, to kind of aspire to the big goals of the Brussels bubbles for some member states. Um, so in order for us to do that, we need to understand that those priorities are not just priorities of the European institutions, but they have to be priorities of the member states. Um, in this way, I could see strategic autonomy uh, being something more than a buzzword. Thank you, Eva. I saw, I saw that Alexander Stubb and then Joanna wanted to make a remark. Go ahead, Alexander. Sorry, you got to switch on your mic. I was uh, trying to be a good student and keep it on mute so that all the sounds from Florence won't come all the way there. Uh, two answers. Uh, the first one is, as long as strategic autonomy does not mean protectionism, uh, closing up, uh, turning inward, sort of as a pretext for what has traditionally been called this sort of European industrial uh, policy. Um, I wrote the Financial Times column in 2016, which was provocatively titled uh, for China, Europe uh, is the new Africa. And the basic argument at the time was that China was doing to uh, European IP um, and IPOs the same that it was doing to African raw materials. And this was the time when the Aikstron case um, hit, uh, in other words, a German company which had some military intelligence that was about to be 
acquired by a Chinese company, the owner of which we weren't really clear about. And I said that we probably need to be aware that this is taking place, but at the same time, we should not uh, overreact. We should have some kind of a European CFIUS. I think that would work quite well. My second answer is, you know what? It's going to depend a little bit on what happens in the US elections. Uh, if we want to have um, space to maneuver, if we want to have strategic uh, uh, autonomy, then it's probably paradoxically going to mean that we're going to sometimes have to make a choice between uh, China uh, and the US. And my rather provocative argument would be that, uh, yes, we have a similar value base with the US and stick with the transatlantic alliance. But if you want to be serious about strategic autonomy, we need to play ball with the Chinese as well. So I would say that we should go 75% American, 25% uh, Chinese. We can do that easier if Donald Trump is elected. If Joe Biden is elected, it's going to be more difficult to do because that's when we have to fall into line uh, and cooperate more with the Americans. Sorry for being so geopolitically shrewd here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. I saw people shaking their heads uh, when you were talking about choosing between China and the US and possibly com combining the two in, in, in this way or the other. Joanna, you would like to comment on this. No, I, I, to, to quickly respond to that, the problem is that, again, I, I, and I, this isn't published yet, but the, there's so much more to the world. Don't, don't underestimate the rest of the world the way that we've, underestim uh, we've been in, underestimated ourselves. So there's lots of things happening in Asia with people who do not cooperate with China. There's lots of things happening in, in other regions, and we really all look to, to the future where Africa comes online. The same way that, that Europe has benefited from diversity, Africa has even more diversity. The same way we were slowed down by figuring out how to collaborate, Africa has been slowed down. So I, we, we really need to look broadly. Back to this autonomy, there's two sides of it. One of it is with the era of the digital, there's an extent to which we cannot be separated anymore. That was already true because of finance, you know, the, the, the ecosystem. But um, we, I think it's really interesting that France created its own COVID app and said, look, for, for small countries, I think they specifically mentioned Slovenia, I'm afraid, <laughs> that maybe they need to use uh, Google and Apple. But hey, we've got our own the infrastructure. For us, it's lower risk to use in-house. Their citizens didn't agree. There's much higher compliance of uh, in Germany, where I'm sitting now, uh, uh, w because of the fact we're using the Apple Google uh, uh, that was seen as more safe. So, so there, we have to recognize the extent to which we are now more and more interdependent, but at the same time, again, like we've seen with logistics chains post-COVID, absolutely we have to maintain diversity, just like we did with airlines, just like we did with GPS. Um, it's a really interesting question. How do we get to the point where we can build the scale of infrastructure? People think AI is like some weird cloudy, you know, a magic thing. It's not. The scale of infrastructure that's been built by the tech giants is immense. So how can we possibly replicate that? Can we get, can we think of some of the tech giants aspects as utilities, transnational utilities? Can we get the tech giants themselves to, to uh, provide redundancy as one of the public goods, one of their forms of redistribution into the UN or, or into the EU, but I'd rather think globally. Um, there's really big, interesting government governance questions about how we're all going to cooperate going forward to have a stable, sustainable planet where we can do business and where we can uh, you know, thrive and raise families. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Joanna. And uh, thanks also to James Cantor for the great question. We've, uh, we've got to move on to the other question by Bartek Kott, and that was about artificial intelligence, big data and campaigning. And I would like to direct this question to Giga Turk. Uh, Giga, what is the, the optimal relationship between these factors I named? Over to you. Um, it's actually similar to the, to the last question, whether we should allow or whether AI should be allowed in political campaigning and, and so on and so forth, or whether it should be prohibited. And again, you know, it's nothing mystical about AI. 
it finds patterns. It finds patterns and it learns from that patterns and it does so better than humans. It lacks some of this broad perspective on things which are kind of not in the data set or which are kind of common sense, but it's getting better with that um, every day. And uh, my, my answer to your question would be uh, yes, allow pattern finding, allow um, studying of the voters, et cetera, in election campaigns, um, possibly in such a way that the competing parties can all use this technology. However, I don't think this will improve democracy. What um, will happen is that increasingly the short-term um, desires of the electorate would be increasingly well presented at what politicians will be saying, of course, at the, at the expense of long-term strategies which politicians should have. Uh, but in principle, I don't think we would achieve anything by, uh, by prohibiting um, the use of AI in, in politics or in campaigning or anywhere. It just has to be competition. If the Republicans and the Democrats can both use Twitter and Facebook and uh, data like Cambridge Analytica, let the best guy win. Thank you very much. We would have two more minutes for a commentary from someone else. I'm just looking at Joanna, uh, who seems eager to comment upon this. Would you, would you want a, a really 120 seconds uh, on this? Over to you. No. All right. Anybody else who would like to comment? Eva, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Very briefly, I think um, it's a topic uh, which we would like to further explore in the uh, newly set up AI committee um, to basically try to make sure we understand what are um, the positive uh, effects of AI in electoral process. Uh, as well as the negative. And on top of my mind, of course, uh, you know, uh, also as Diga was saying, I mean, one could see opportunities um, in a way that we could better reach people, uh, for example, and inform them about the political process. Um, there is such a big chunk of society still nowadays uh, that is uh, unsure what the European institutions do, and not to mention it's unsure what even their local institutions are doing. Um, and in this way, you could uh, actually strengthen, in a way, the democratic society because you provide more information. But of course, uh, that would be a very ideal scenario. Um, and unfortunately, we have seen it way too often how uh, AI uh, is um, embedded for uh, improper uh, use of data uh, and on the darker purposes um, in campaigning. And of course, clearly Cambridge Analytica uh, is, is one such uh, example, uh, but it's almost on a daily basis. Even this morning, I came across an article um, which, of course, once again, states uh, how often um, the old right ideas um, and ideas that are uh, basically uh, promoted uh, that are, 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 are based on this information are shared tens of thousands more times than fact-based stories. Um, so um, when we are to regulate in a way how fact-based trustworthy news and claims go viral, uh, we need to make sure we not only use the false ones. Um, and I think this will, will and uh, was and will continue uh, to be a major problem uh, in the uh, elections, uh, as we are seeing also in the US uh, right now, but also uh, all over the world. Thanks a lot, Eva. I think this is the right time to wrap up the whole debate. Um, unless there is an urgent comment from any of you, that is not the case, then let me give you the, 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 yes, uh, sorry, Alexander Stubb. But very I was going to give you a commercial break at the School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute. We have an absolutely fantastic center called EDMO, which does fax checking. Please go ahead and check it out. Great. Thank you so much, EDMO in Florence. OK, now the wrap up, uh, the takeaways, uh, the European Union is off to a good start, arguably, in, in uh, the white paper of the Commission. Um, 
in order to uh, promote leadership and 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 promote um, a better uh, development, a better approach to uh, artificial intelligence in the European Union. We have this uh, a triangle of regulation, competition and finance, uh, which will keep us busy for the years to come. And on regulation, I think we can all agree that the uh, the magical formula will be to to make uh, regulation enhancing and not impeding innovation and development. Uh, that's the most important one. The, I think on the on the question of the EU setting standards that are uh, actually joined and observed by the rest of the world, the EU can set standards, and we have seen this over the last couple of years. Um, uh, and uh, and the EU actually uh, can. It has a big trump card, and that is uh, the single market and access to it by others, um, which uh, which gives the EU some uh, some negotiating power. Uh, so the uh, the question of the European Union getting countries like China, for example, uh, to accept. Uh, moral standards and ethical standards that they wouldn't accept for the use of AI and big data in their own country, uh, is the chances are good that they would accept at least that for the uh, single market of the European Union. And finally, um, and probably most importantly, the uh, intricate interplay between artificial intelligence, big data on the one hand, and democracy on the other. And uh, I, th I think we've had some, some beautiful uh, and some less beautiful examples. We've the case of Cambridge Analytica was discussed, but also the prospect that actually artificial intelligence and, uh, uh, and big data could enhance um, the leadership of a democratic country in uh, gauging what people really expect and uh, adjusting their policies accordingly. The mo the, and, and of course, uh, uh, in authoritarian uh, regimes, big data and artificial intelligence can be used for nefarious purposes that I think we don't even need to debate about this. Um, and the last point on this AI and democracy one uh, is the most optimistic scenario would be one where AI is distributed to the people and empowers individuals to better participate in the democratic process. And I think that um, with that optimistic scenario, I uh, uh, might as well uh, leave, uh, leave you for the takeaways. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers for uh, participating in this, giving their, uh, their arguments, sharing their wisdom uh, and their insights. And uh, I would like to hand it uh, back over to Anna. Thank you very much all for participating. Anna, floor is yours again. A great panel to end our forum with. And right before our closing remarks, ladies and gentlemen, we will break for a short uh, five minutes. We'll be back soon.
Ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, for the concluding remarks, I'd like to welcome the Secretary General of the European People's Party and the Secretary Treasurer of the Martin Center, Antonio Lopez Isturiz White, joining us online. Tono, welcome. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, dear friends. It is an honor for me to close this year's extraordinary and uh, for the first time, uh, Digital uh, Economic Ideas Forum. I would like to especially thank uh, Nicolas Jurinda, Tommy Kutan, and moderators like Anna, like Roland, uh, Dimitar, uh, Margareta, and uh, all those people behind the cameras, uh, the dedicated staff of the Martin Center. Thank you very much. Uh, mission accomplished. It was not easy, I know. But the purpose of this year's uh, forum is to discuss the potential and ability of the European Union to have uh, a more geopolitical and a coherent economic strategy on the global stage. Like uh, my friend, Nicolas Jurinda, we are set, we are facing urgent challenges. Not just the immediate danger of a pandemic that isn't slowing down, but also other threats that will continue being imminent even after the pandemic. Trade protectionism, great power, competition, rapid technology, innovations, outdated educational systems, and many others. In this context, exchange of view like the ones we had yesterday and today are key. Thanks to the Martin Center and its staff, we were able to hear expert voices on the most pressing issues facing Europe. And not just from politicians. We heard from all sectors of society, from civil servants, from uh, private sector and academics. As we saw, the pandemic has been an accelerator of uh, existing trends, trends that will continue existing in the future. The challenges have to be met with bold action at the European level. And in this forum, we had lively discussions about the detailed policy proposals currently underway in the European Commission and the European Parliament. This is exactly the case, <clears throat> for example, of the Green, green Deal and the ecological transition. Through the, great deal, the Green Deal, <clears throat> the EU has set enormous expectations, and it has done so the right way, involving the private sector with targeted and practical solutions. As the Commission has aptly named one of its instruments, we are striving for a just transition. A transition where the cost is distributed and it is fair. A transition that includes everyone and leaves no one behind. Though we represent less than 10% of global emissions, the world recognizes that we are a leader in this field. Our actions have reverberated across markets and countries. And as my friend Jyrki Katainen said, Europe will show the way to build a sustainable and carbon neutral economy. We have to take advantage of the historic recovery packets and the subsequent funding. We need bold actions at the European and at member state level. And I am glad that as always, DPP has been the most productive voice in this debate. Another EPP priority that we discussed was world trade and the many challenges it is facing. From the pandemic to global trade tensions and the race of populism, world trade and the very idea of open economies are being questioned. Trade is a crucial element for our prosperity, and we need to protect that. But we cannot trade just for the sake of doing trading. As my friend and the new European Trade Commissioner, Vice President Dombrovskis, and said, and previous Commissioner Phil Hovland defended, we have to be open to world trade while dealing with the new world reality we are living in. An open strategic economy to take care of ourselves while it's not being naive. We are open. But we have to face challenges from other countries, which means we need a new strategy. Once again, this Commission has been able to think strategically about the challenge we face with the upcoming review of our trade policy. But our power cannot and should not be ignored by those who seek to show us irrelevant, both within and outside our borders, trade 
is one of our strongest tools. Not because we can leverage and bully each other through our single market. We are not and should never be unilateralist by choice but because the, of the power of influence of our market. As Mrs. Bradford argued, as long as there is globalization, the EU's influence, the so-called Brussels effect, will not diminish. We are not unilateralist, and as such, we have to work towards a strong and key role for the WTO. We have to show that negotiations and dialogue, not tariffs and confrontations, are the only way for our societies to benefit from world trade. We have to unlock trade deals with our allies, like the United States, the UK, Mercosur, while also finding solutions to the challenge that countries like China pose to the global trading, trading system. Only through such multilateral approach that includes our partners, we can truly use the power of trade. Friends, we know how populists act when it comes to trade, which is exactly why we need to involve citizens and hear their concerns. Contrary to some voices out there, trade must not come at the expense of some and the benefit of others. However, as uh, Julia Winkler said, the benefits of trade are not always going where the cost is. It is on this difference that we have to focus. As I mentioned, the emergence of new technologies has posed a very serious challenge to the way of our governments work. Social media has changed how citizens perceive their governments and how they interact with the political sphere. Our societies and our politics are more polarized than ever. The digital revolution that is currently underway also means that much of our workforce is not ready for the labor market of tomorrow. It also means that our businesses are at risk of getting crowded out of the digital economies of the future. I share with my good friend Alex Stuck, not only being old enough to remember that Europe in the 90s was at the forefront of digital systems, but also to say that we got lazy. And we have to wake up. We have to adapt our way of thinking, our policies, to this reality of digitalization. For example, ethics. That would be, that would have been my question to the panelists. Once, once again, the European Union has been strategic in its thinking, and has aimed to find a third way, a European way of doing things. As my colleague and very good friend Pablo Arias mentioned, we need to regulate our digital single market based on our values and our European way of life. If we do so, not only will we deal with the current challenges, we will have a competitive advantage in the economics of the future. Friends, I would like to conclude by saying that we do not have to shy away from our strengths from our global role as a regulatory power, from the need for an open strategic autonomy, and for the defense of our European way of life. The pandemic has presented a set of new challenges, but most importantly, an opportunity to show European citizens that we are indispensable, and that only coordinated policy decisions at the EU level will allow us to move forward. Our economic strategies are based on our European values and in our citizens' best interest. If implemented well, they will lead us to a competitive advantage and towards a truly geopolitical and coherent economic strategy on the global stage. There is hope and we have the necessary means to achieve our goals. Let's work on it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary General, for your very inspiring words. At this point, I'd like to thank our speakers and moderators, and especially you, our online audience. We are glad that technology allows us to stay connected, especially in these difficult times, and discuss important topics for the society. A big thank you goes once again to at and Google, Microsoft, and Sky, who have powered this fully digital economic ideas forum. 
Continue following the Martin Center activities to stay informed and most importantly, stay safe and healthy. Until next time.